just want to welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Mayor David Darkwoods. I want to welcome you to my sort of inaugural kickoff uh, town hall forum. Uh, I'm actually cheating a little bit on this one because we uh, we do a monthly, I do a monthly meeting here at the Senior Center where we have pizza lunch and it's just an open Q&A uh, for folks who want to come in and meet with me and talk with me. And because we had that regularly scheduled, I thought we would use this month's installment to focus on the budget uh, because we're in the budget season right now. So. I'm going to give a, just a quick presentation so you can eat, and I'll just go through it quickly. And then I really want to turn the floor over uh, to you and have, get your questions, get your input. Uh, one of the things that I put forward um, as a candidate in, in, in my inaugural was that I wanted to go out and do these before I finalized my budget. In the past, we put out a budget and then gone out and talked to people. I really wanted to get input from people as I, in this final month, as I try to put together a budget that I have to deliver to the City Council at its first meeting in May. Um, and I'm required by law to deliver a balanced budget to the City Council that they then spend the month of May uh, studying, debating, and then they take votes on it in June so that we can get it in place for the new fiscal year for July 1st. Um, so this is kind of a quick, you won't be able to read any of this, but this just shows you our total budget, which is about uh, $93 million. Um, and we have, we have four separate budgets within our budget because we have our general fund budget, which is mostly what we're going to talk about today, which is about 77 million. And then we have these three separate budgets, which are our sewer fund budget, our water fund, and our solid waste. Those are enterprise funds. Those are completely segregated by law from the rest of the budget. And they are, uh, so when you pay your sewer bill, the user fees that are collected go into that fund and are used to, to uh, perpetuate the activities of the sewer fund. The same goes for the other three funds. So the total budget is $93 million, but really what's in play is this $77 million general fund. So I'm going to go over just quickly some of the revenues. Um, what makes up that $77 million budget? As you can see, I'll let you get by me here, Robert. Good. No problem. Uh, so the largest, you can see the largest chunk is taxes. So 60, over 60% of that is taxes. Now that's not only your property tax, that's excise tax, that's the taxes that we collect in as meals tax and hotel tax, uh, any of those forms of revenues that the state allows us to collect. Uh, the next biggest number you'll see is uh, what's called state revenue cherry sheet. Uh, back in the old days they used to give cities and towns their, their state revenue numbers on a pink piece of paper which became known as the cherry sheet. And even though it comes electronically now, it doesn't come on a pink piece of paper, they still call it a cherry sheet. So 20.8% of our revenue comes back to us in the form of state aid from our state government. That's an important number that we're going to revisit later. Then you can see smaller areas, um, interfund operating transfers. That is where we, we have money that come from those other revenue funds into the general fund. Fines and forfeitures are for things like uh, parking tickets. Uh, licenses and, and permits are for things like if you license your dog or you get a building permit. Charges for services is largely we charge tuition at the Smith Vocational School. That's one of the largest areas there. Um, so those are that's sort of the, the pie in terms of where those general fund dollars come to. Uh, property taxes, we all you all are probably familiar with Proposition Two and a Half. So under Proposition Two and a Half, the city is only allowed to raise property taxes. 2.5% each year. We are allowed additional um, uh, growth depending if we have new growth in our budget. So for example, if there's new buildings or new businesses that come online, we also get to add that in. But pretty much you can see that climbing at 2.5%, this is what's happened to the amount of revenue that we have come in. You'll see there's a little bit of a spike here uh, in the 2009 to 2010 budget. That was the year that the city, the voters of the city, passed a $2 million operating override, a general override, which meant we were allowed to override Proposition 2 and a half and raise an additional $2 million in revenue that year. Uh, and then that revenue just basically, you then begin recalculating again from where you left off. What's uh, the difference between the two lines? So this is the actual, and this is adjusted for inflation. Uh, so you'll see adjusted for inflation with the cost of everything else going up, that that revenue and that's one of the big arguments about Proposition 2.5 is that cities and towns can increase by 2.5% when many other things are going up. You know, even just the cost of living has gone up much higher than 2.5% each year. Uh, so the next slide 
So this shows what our, our tax rate is compared to neighboring communities. So in the year that just ended, FY12, we pay $13.35 per thousand of property value in Northampton. So when you get your bill, it's calculated on a tax rate of 13.35. We've taken a group of cohort communities that are in our area, and we're just sort of comparing the tax rates per thousand. So you see Northampton is on the lower end of that scale, um, all the way up to Longmeadow, who's up to 19.68. And there's a variety of factors, obviously, they may have higher values. They may have uh, they may have um, uh, uh, done overrides over time. There's a number of factors that may influence that tax rate. But this is how we stack up to our neighbors. Now, this is the average property value. So the state average for a single family for, for a piece of property in Massachusetts, the average valuation, which is what your taxes are based on, is 358.5. You'll see in Northampton, the average parcel is 304, and then you can see how we stack up to other communities. Really, Longmeadow and Amherst being the only communities that have higher uh, average property values than us. This is the average single-family property tax bill uh, in, in those same neighboring communities, uh, keeping in mind that the state average for, for FY11 uh, was $4,537 per average tax bill. You see here in Northampton, our average tax bill is a little over 4,000, and then you see the range. Uh, obviously, Longmeadow, Amherst, and East Longmeadow uh, a little bit higher than the other communities lower. This is a really important number, and this gets back to that pie that we were talking about, uh, where we looked at state aid. And you can see how state aid, we've sort of taken a 10-year snapshot of what's happened to state aid over time. Uh, and you can sort of, it sort of follows the economy. Uh, during the downturn in the early part of the, of, the, uh, of the 2000 decade, you can see state aid decreased. Then it kind of made, made a little bit of a comeback, although it never quite got back to even where we were in 2003 before it then, when the, when the economy went south, state aid went south. Um, to look at it in terms of how that has impacted our budget, so back in 2003, state aid represented 24% of our operating budget. It's now down to about 12.7% as in terms of what 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 percentage of it we use to be able to run our budget. So that's essentially half over that period. Um, and again, that puts more pressure on other sources of revenue, namely property taxes, to be able to fund the things we fund. This is just a quick slide to show um, uh, hotel and motel uh, meals tax, uh, which obviously in Northampton we have a lot of restaurants, we have a lot of tourism. Uh, back in 2000, during the 2009 budget process, the, uh, the governor and the legislature enacted a local option meals and hotel tax, which allowed cities and towns to raise their own meals tax higher and their own hotel tax higher. We, in fact, did that because we really needed the revenue. And you can see this blue area is, is the increase uh, in meals. This is the meals tax, which was just added. There always was a hotel tax that we collected locally. We were allowed to raise that, and we were allowed to have local option meals tax. If we looked at this in FY12, it continues to go up. So that's been one positive revenue trend uh, for us. We've had a really strong uh, tax base in terms of hotel and motel restaurants. This is new growth. Again, the, this basically looks at uh, new construction, uh, new businesses that have come online, new homes. Uh, this is the piece that when we calculate Proposition 2 and a half, we're allowed to take Proposition 2 and a half plus any new growth that we've had. And again, if you look at the economy over the last 10 years, you can kind of see where FY 2009, the, the real estate bubble uh, collapsed and, uh, and people stopped building, they stopped building new homes, companies stopped expanding. Uh, and, and we started to make a comeback in FY12, although for the current fiscal year that we're projecting, we're really not seeing an increase for, for FY13. Uh, people are now kind of slowing down a little bit. They are still doing work on their homes, but there hasn't been as much new construction as there was in FY12. FY12 includes Cole Morgan, which was a major uh, uh, construction project, as well as many of the new homes at, at Village Hill. So this is looking at our new growth. Um, compared to what other communities' new growth has been. Again, I think Northampton has done quite well. Our new growth for FY12 was worth about 654,000. You 
can see how we compare to other communities. So even though new growth has been fairly flat everywhere, we've still done better than most. Obviously, West Springfield is off the charts. Uh, they have a lot more commercial developable land, uh, and so they've done a lot in that area. Uh, this is just a quick uh, thing showing, again, it seems like an innocuous number, inspection, permit revenue, but it's really tied closely to the economy. It's tied closely to that new growth number where less and less people are taking out permits. We, and permits are actually based on the value of the property or the work you're doing. So you can kind of see how that number has been very cyclical. And we're actually going to have to downgrade our, our estimates in that category. Here's one that everyone would be familiar with in their own savings accounts or 401ks. This is investment income. The city does have a considerable amount of money that we keep in investment, uh, uh, short-term investments, et cetera. Um, and, and so we do count on some of that return. You can again see as we went up the roller coaster uh, and then things crashed, and basically our, our um, interest uh, revenue has been negligible the last few years. It's been a remarkable shift. Now, those are the revenues, so now we'll look at some of the spending areas in the budget. This shows you that, again, that $77 million uh, pie chart, and it breaks it down into the big major categories. Education, uh, almost 39%, that includes the public schools as well as Smith Vocational. The next largest category is employee benefits, so that's all of our salaries, our health care, retirement. Um, Public safety, that includes police, fire, dispatch, our building inspections, and our parking enforcement. Uh, and then you can see another big number that stands out here is debt service. That's essentially the money that we pay uh, on projects like the senior center, projects like the high school renovations we've done. If we buy uh, large trucks and we bond them for 20 years, we have to pay the debt on that every year. And then you can see the smaller, other smaller areas uh, general government, this little slice, 4.9, that's like the mayor's office, city council, treasurer, appropriation, all the sort of city count, city hall functions. And then you can see all the other little categories. Um, in terms of programmatic expenditures, education uh, represents, this is taking that same 38%, but then factoring in uh, also what we spend on health care, salaries, debt service, et cetera, and it shows education is about 53%, public safety 15%, Public works gets bumped up to about 6%, and then you can see all the other areas in the budget from there. This shows how we spend on our, on our per pupil, kindergarten through 12. That's obviously a hot topic, particularly in the Valley. There's been a lot of discussion in Amherst about how they compare to other communities. And this kind of shows the state average in FY11, uh, we, uh, the state average is 13,371 per pupil. Um, you can see Northampton is right Again, in the middle, higher end here, 12,608. And then you've got Amherst and Amherst Regional that are, are at the high end uh, in that chart. Again, keep in mind, over the last uh, four to seven years, Amherst has done three general operating overrides uh, compared to our one uh, override. So that's been the way I believe that they've been able to increase those numbers. Um, Again, salaries and wages. We're, we employ people. That's what the city does. It delivers services, whether it's teachers teaching in classrooms, whether it's firefighters or police officers or uh, the person that you know, uh, takes, your, um, uh, takes your money at the collector's counter, whatever it is, this is the biggest portion. So 54% of our general fund budget is salary and wages. And then you add that in with uh, health care and retirement, 74% of our budget is basically people. Uh, which means that when you have to make cuts, it becomes very difficult to avoid uh, or either affecting people's salaries, affecting people's cost of living increases, or in some cases, uh, uh, people losing their jobs um, as, we try to, as we try to balance the budget. You can also see some of the other areas, but this is really to illustrate what the lion's share of the budget is made up of. This kind of shows the salaries in various areas, again, broken down in those programmatic areas. Really, um, you can sort of see uh, public safety and education have been the areas that have shown, if any, expansion, a little bit of expansion. Um, and in terms of the other areas, those have been fairly static. Uh, again, uh, as the community grows, as they have, we have to respond to more in diverse emergencies, uh, as more uh, students come into the schools, as we have to provide additional services to students, 
uh, this sort of reflects uh, the, the growing complexity of the mission in those two areas. This is health insurance. Again, nothing that should be surprising to anybody in their own uh, pocketbooks or in, in a private corporation. Our health insurance uh, costs have risen dramatically. Again, uh, spending about $6 million in 2003 uh, to up over uh, $9 million in 2011. Uh, you can see we've done a pretty good job in the last few years. So over that nine-year period, 6.47% every year going up uh, health insurance. Keep in mind, that's against the backdrop of the 2.5% that we're allowed to expand our budget. Um, uh, Mayor Higgins did a great job over the last several years working with the employee unions to try to modify our health plan and, and increase deductibles and try to tweak it to keep the cost down. Um, unfortunately, we kind of run out of tweaks right now, and so now we're, we're looking at an eight, now it's an 8.25% increase in our health insurance under the current plan, or we're also looking at some other plans. The employees are considering another plan that would, that would uh, create more cost savings, but at more expense to the employees. So I'm waiting to get a recommendation back from the Insurance Advisory Committee, which is, a, which is made up of the heads of all the various uh, uh, unions uh, who I meet with, and we talk about these health care issues, and then they go back to their members uh, and make a recommenda recommendation to me as to what sort of plan we should try to move forward with. Debt service. Um, it's hard to see the breakdown here, but there's different categories. The top two are actually other sources, um, which is federal, uh, sort of like the CDBG, or uh, like, for example, this senior center, we're paying for the debt on it using community development block grant money, which is federal monies. Uh, CPA is another area uh, when we borrowed money for Forbes Library, CPA pays the debt service. Uh, so the, the, the red area is something called MSBA. That's the state's reimbursement on our big school projects. So we have the high school, JFK. Um, we get 75% of that debt gets paid for by the state. So this top two is sort of out of our control. These lower two are the ones that have the biggest impact on the budget. This is debt excluded. So when we did a debt exclusion on the police station, the taxpayers voted to allow us to borrow $10 million above and beyond that 2.5% limit. Uh, and then we have to uh, pay the debt service on that over time. This lower line, this lower segment, is, is how much we have to put into the general, from the general fund budget to pay our, basically our mortgage payment. You know, we, we take out bonds on buildings, on equipment, uh, on you know, whether it's buying a new dishwasher in the schools, whether it's buying a new sanding truck the DPW, whatever it is, we tend to buy it and, bar and bond for it over time. So you'll see as we move from 2012 to 2013, there's a fairly sizable spike in what the general fund has to contribute. It's about $600,000, and that's mainly the new debt service for the police station and for some of the other items that we just bonded uh, earlier this year. This is another big uh, cost factor. This is school choice and charter sending. Um, school choice is when students opt to move to another district. Uh, they, want to, they want their child to go to East Hampton or to Hadley or South Hadley. We have to pay a tuition from our school, uh, from our budget to the, uh, to the, to the uh, sending school. And then you'll see charter schools came into the picture um, uh, in green here and then school choice. So charter schools and school choice, again, when a child chooses to go to one of our three, four charter schools in the area, we have to pay a tuition uh, to that school. And that comes actually comes out of our general fund budget. But you can see that's been a trend that's been increasing every year. There is some reimbursement on the charter school. It comes later, and it fades away over time. Uh, so the charter school is a very contentious issue in, in municipal government. Um, and it's one that there's a lot of talk about with school committees around the state. Because of the fact that it's a, essentially a state form school, that's regulated by the state. There's no local political body that oversees that money. It's run with local tax dollars. So there's been a bit of a debate a ranging, about, a ranging about it, but again, many families choose to send their uh, child either to other districts or to charter schools, and you can see the growth uh, in terms of our budget expenses to cover that. Snow and ice and veterans, these are two of our budget areas that are some, have been somewhat unpredictable over time. Veterans benefits in Massachusetts, uh, 
a city like Northampton is required to have a veterans agent and we're required to pay veterans benefits. We do get reimbursed by the state 75% in the next fiscal year, but we have to put out the 100% of the money in each budget year. And you can see essentially, uh, you know, since the, since the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the fact that we have a VA hospital here in Northampton, we've had a huge uh, skyrocketing in terms of the number of veterans that we serve here locally. Uh, we're obviously proud to do it and committed to do it, but it's something that's affected our, our, our budget, and we have to factor that in. The snow and ice is the money that we put out every year in snowstorms. Uh, if, if we have a winter like last winter, it's off the charts expensive. A winter like this winter, we're able to save a little money because we haven't had as many storms. We haven't had to pay as much overtime. Veterans, tenants, uh, to totally reimbursed? No, 75% reimbursed. So we get 75% the next year. Yeah. And, but again, we have to put out, a, we have to budget 100% of it. Um, this is uh, this is our savings account. These are our reserve funds, and this is, again is a very important uh, part of our budget. We try to put we try to put money into a savings account, like like most individuals are encouraged to do, so that we have money for emergencies. We have money if a if a roof fails, if a boiler fails, uh, or if we have very difficult budget years. And you can see our general fund free cash uh, beginning in around FY06. We, we, we essentially, as state aid started to plummet, and as the economy started to plummet, we had we began dipping into our free cash to be able to shore up the budget. So our reserves, uh, both in general fund free cash, capital stabilization is for uh, put aside for capital projects, and then general fund stabilization. All three of these accounts have basically plunged. We tried to begin rebuilding them again so that we can have them for a rainy day and to cover. Un seeing expenses, but that's been one of the big challenges. It's also a challenge because our bond rating, uh, in many cases, they look very carefully at how much we have in reserve. We were able to maintain our, our high bond rating during the last uh, uh, bond sale that we did, but they did put a note of caution there that our, our, our uh, free cash uh, was low. And this actually shows you how we compare to other communities. Again, these are the two major funds, stabilization and free cash. This shows you how we compare uh, to other communities in terms of, you know, so here's Northampton. We've got about, uh, what does it say, um, uh, I think about 2% of our available budget in free cash. I think they often recommend 5% as a good rule of thumb, and obviously you'd like to have more. Um, but this shows how we compare to those other communities. This shows us compared to similar sized communities across the entire state. So we not only have Western Mass, We've added some places like Dartmouth and Franklin and Watertown and Gloucester. Again, many other communities have much larger uh, reserves that they can rely on uh, and draw on in terms of uh, in terms of dealing with tough budgets. We've done that. We've pretty much relied on them, and now we're in a re rebuilding phase. So, what are the favorable trends? Uh, uh, strong tax collections. We have very few delinquent properties in Northampton. We collect about 98% of the taxes. Um, we have a relatively low tax rate compared with other comparable communities, as we've shown. Our values have remained fairly high. Uh, home sales have been fairly robust despite uh, the economic downturn. We have, a, we have an average single-family tax bill that's below the state average. We have had several um, Revenue streams that have been increasing, uh, motor vehicle excise, parking meter and garage, hotel motel. We've maintained our excellent bond rating. We've been able to keep some of our insurance costs low. This last one, you know, we've had excellent health uh, insurance cost containment. Unfortunately, I think this year, uh, some of that may, we, we may not be able to contain it as much. Still, we're gonna hopefully stay below 10%, which is kind of an industry increase. Uh, but, but, but we're not able to keep it in check as we've been able to do over the last five to six years. What are the unfavorable trends? Again, this state aid number, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, so from F fiscal year 2008 to fiscal year 12, we've seen a reduction in 3.5 million in our state aid. And in, in FY13, the governor's budget, they are funding us, uh, I think it's about 268 or, or so below level funding. So the governor is projecting to cut our state aid in his budget. Um, 
no excess levy capacity. Again, we really were, we're, we're taxing to the full two and a half percent, so we can't increase that. We've got some things like the landfill. The landfill did provide revenue to the general fund. Um, it paid a host fee, and it also paid for some of the city services that were provided to run the landfill. That's going away. So we're now in a process this year and next year weaning ourselves completely off that. So we're gonna lose that revenue. Um, new growth is not expected to increase next year uh, based on what the assessors are telling us. Um, in interest on investments has been flat. This employee health insurance is a big one. We started at 12.5% was the increase that our provider gave to us, which was about a $1.2 million uh, dollar increase. We've now been going back and forth, uh, re-looking at numbers. We're down to about 8.25%, which is still almost a million dollar increase. Yes, sir? The new growth, uh, how is that relating to your capital budget? Uh, the new growth? Well, if your new growth is expected to decline, mm -hmm. Is your capital budget still constant, or is it increasing? In terms of, well, that's, a, that's actually going to be one of the other negatives. I'm not sure how much of a capital budget we'll have this year, uh, because we don't have a lot of additional funds uh, to be able to do a, a, a robust capital. So that's going to be limiting. Because the new growth is expected to decline, it's possible that there will be a cut in personnel uh, well, we're, we, we hope to try to avoid that if we can, but what it essentially means is the, the, our ability to raise uh, above and beyond Proposition 2.5, right. that's the one area where we're allowed well, to go above There's that. the other side of 2.5 to cut, but we'll mm -hmm. save that for another day. Um, the underride. <coughs> the un underride. We rarely you, use underride, yeah. Yeah, now, but mm -hmm. the new growth has a direct impact on any projected capital improvements. In the sense that it, that it has an overall impact on the overall budget, yes, yeah. it does. Uh, because again, the, the pie, how big the pie is, is dependent on that two and a half increase plus that new growth. Do you have any specific figures on the projected capital cost? Uh, let's see, in terms of what we're gonna spend this yeah. year on capital Well, cost? actually, I'd like to go into the next five years. I can, I don't have, that would be a whole other presentation which I can get for you, but essentially we have a cap, we have a debt schedule uh, where we, which I didn't bring today because I thought that would be a little too much for people, but we have a debt schedule over the next 20 years where we program things like the police station, you can see the other major like the JFK, the high school. Do you have that related to the impact on taxes? We have it related in terms of what the general fund's obligation is to pay the debt service. So when you saw that slide earlier that showed levy supported debt, um, uh, that was showing what our obligation is. And that obligation goes up this year. That new growth of decline really has a tremendous impact. Completely. Uh, it's of, all the, of all the issues. And that's why, that's why economic development is a major focus in terms of you know, the, the, the stuff that's happening on King Street, for example, where we now finally have something happening with the old price chopper. That's going to mean new growth on the tax rolls when that becomes a business again, starts employing people, uh, selling goods and services. We'll be able to increase uh, their tax bill. That will be considered new growth. Uh, uh, next I, year's and what about intergovernmental transfers, increase in federal aid for anything? No. In okay. fact, CDBG, which is Community Development Block Grant from HUD, we've been cut about 30% in the last two years. Uh, that's, that's partly what pays for the senior center, the debt on the senior center. It's also what allows us to provide what are called public service grants to uh, social service agencies, homeless shelters, etc. I just signed all the award letters for those, and again, we've had to cut those sharply um, because federal funds have dried up. So um, again, you can see the other factors that we've talked about, uh, low reserves, veteran be benefits continuing to increase. This, this is, I don't expect you to see all the numbers, but I've been providing a sheet like this to the city council pretty much at every meeting because many of these numbers are are somewhat in flux, the way that our budgeting process works. Uh, so we have over here, we show the two and a half increase, the new growth, plus the new growth, uh, plus the debt exclusions that we have, uh, plus any excess levy capacity. Basically, 
about 2.3 million is what we're in expecting in new revenues based on, we, we know that based on what we're allowed to do. Then there's a, a number of areas where we have to look at, okay, um, parking meters, we're expecting an additional almost $200,000 in parking revenue. Again, we're projecting that based on increases this year. There's a number of other areas where we're projecting increases. Uh, you can see inspections and permits, We've had, we're actually downgrading that because those have slowed down. Um, parking tickets, we've actually seen a decline in parking tickets, so we're going to have to downgrade that revenue. State aid, here's that number, 168208 The governor is cutting us by almost $166,000. The, the House of Representatives is supposed to come out with its budget this week, which a lot of municipal leaders are going to be watching very closely. We're hoping they're going to restore that. We're hoping they're going to give us more than that um, so that we can build our budgets with that additional funds. Uh, then you can see the solid waste enterprise. We're losing, a, we're going to have to lose 183,648 in revenue uh, from the solid waste enterprise fund. Again, that's part of that weaning ourselves off the landfill as it closes. Um, so at the end of the day, when you net this all out, we've got about 1.9 uh, in, in, uh, in new revenue expected. And then these are the costs that we know we have to pay. These are the increases in our costs. There's that debt service that we talked about, health insurance veterans benefits, our, our retirement system, we have to increase by about 160 to keep it solvent, uh, snow and ice, unemployment, uh, state assessments, custodial staff for the new police station, so about 2.6 million. Um, so again, take those increases uh, versus the cost increases, and we're left with about $722,000 that we need to kind of, we need to make that up, we need to find a way, that's our debt right now as of today. That we, the deficit that we need to eliminate in order to balance the budget in time for July 1st. So the bottom line again, simple math, our revenues are increasing by 1.9 million, our expenditures are going to go up by 2.6 million, again a gap of a little over 700,000. Health insurance is really the big moving target right now, 8.5%, uh, which means 950,000. Um, I'm supposed to hear back from the Insurance Advisory Committee next week. Uh, they're going back and having meetings with all their various unions, uh, and then they're going to come back to me and say, uh, we want to go with this plan, or we're willing to go to a less expensive plan, uh, which would potentially uh, give us another four to $500,000 in savings. Um, the way it works under collective bargaining, if in fact they were to go with a lower plan, I would be required to bargain the impact of that, if it's going to cost them more money out of their wallet. So it, even though we may realize savings, net savings, uh, overall savings of four hundred thousand, I'll have to bargain the impact of that. So I may, we may not realize all of it. <coughs> state aid again. They they, uh, they they cut us by two hundred and sixty-eight eight a couple of years ago. Last year the governor said we're going to give you this amount, and then we're going to if, if revenues are good, we'll give you this additional two sixty-eight eight that we cut uh, the year before. Last year they did that in October. They gave us 268.8. Of course, we can't build it into a budget unless we have it before uh, before July 1st. Um, so our hope is that the, the House and Senate will actually put that into the into the back end of the state budget so that we can budget that in uh, and, and increase it by more. We hope. This is the question we were talking about our capital program. Again, we're not going to have a lot of extra money lying around to do much of a capital program. Obviously, we have to have some money for roads and sidewalks. We get some Chapter 90 money from the state, which is dedicated for those projects. Uh, uh, but again, it's basically capital. Uh, some of those projects, plus we have to have some in our savings account for boilers, for roofs, for those kinds of things. Um, low reserves. So our preliminary target, again, when I went out to department heads and said, start building your budgets, what I told them essentially was do a level-funded budget. Um, again, our, our overall city budget is not level funded. We're about 700000 out of level. But I ask people to start with level funded. Um, and that, that's sort of the conversation we've been having. Yes. Well, we've just moved back to Massachusetts. So an unfair question. Has there been any move by the schools to spin off an independent funding with the 501c3? We do have, we actually, since Proposition 2.5, there's been a number of a lot of school districts, including ours, yeah. there have been education foundations that have been formed. 
uh, separate 501c3s where lots of uh, dollars have been raised privately to, uh, to support the schools. Um, again, it's primarily been to supplement the schools, not to supplant local funding, but in Northampton we've had what's called the Northampton Education Foundation for 20 years. They've raised millions of dollars for small grant programs for the schools. They also have an endowment. Uh, uh, has any of that been put into operating school operating costs? Uh, only to the extent that it covers things like uh, paying for substitutes so that teachers can work on projects or do professional development. But generally, the problem with that kind of fundraising for operating expenses is it's really one-time money. It's very difficult to budget to hire somebody on a one-year basis that you may then have there to There hasn't been any move to designate it for a specific educational program. Uh, there's, again, people apply for grants and the grants are then awarded. Uh, and we have the superintendent here, so he can speak to that as well. Um, but, but essentially, that's, what, that's how it's worked in Massachusetts. I know in California and in some other states, there have been uh, much more ambitious <coughs> programs. Um, where people have actually raised operating expenses. Yes, it's relieved the budget, the municipal budgets. I think here in Massachusetts there's been um, some reluctance to do that. I'm not quite sure what it's based on. I think some, uh, the, the philosophy has been to really supplement but not supplant tax dollars. Um, but, but again, we may be moving to a new era where that's where we have to go. Um, so, these are just some discussion points that I threw up there. You know, what programs and services should be our top priorities in a fiscally constrained budget? What suggestions do you have for reducing expenses? What ideas do you have for increasing revenues? And then just general comments and questions. So now I wanted to kind of turn the floor over to you uh, and get your ideas, get your questions. But I wonder, before we start, could we just go around the room and have everyone introduce themselves and just say where you live in the city? Do you uh, Don Levinson, we just moved to Northampton. A month ago. Oh, welcome. <laughs> Back into Massachusetts. Welcome. And where, where are you living in the city? Uh, we're, we're living... Lathrop Retirement. Oh, Lathrop Retirement. Lathrop Retirement. On Bridge Road? Or? Right. Oh, on Bridge Street. Um, uh, I think it's Bridge well, Street. Bridge Road. Yeah. Bridge Road. Yeah. Exactly. Bridge Road. Yeah. 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 We have Bridge Street and Bridge Road. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You said it changed. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, I'm Cynthia Neary. Great. Well, welcome to both. Thank you. I'm Eva Weber. I live on Riverbank Road. Do you want us to say your name, or? Do you want to say your name? Dominic Bellanduno. Hi, I'm Lynn Simmons. I'm um, a mayor's aide in the mayor's office. <coughs> Steve Dean, next door. Robert Montague, I live up in Laurelwood Apartments on Hatfield Street. Mm -hmm. Brian Felder, I'm the superintendent of the Peter Jones, Briarwood Drive. Jack Fuga. Yeah, we're in the Cheer South Street. I live in Northampton. My name is Robert Proctor. Uh, and I live in Northampton. I, I came yes, I came I came to a to a meeting in October. Exactly. Yep. Yep. I remember. Thank you for oh, when you first arrived here. I first arrived in Northampton October 13, 1950. My, my father. My father. My father was in the military. And he retired. Oh, and they figured that I should really, I should go to Clark School, so they moved here for me to go to Clark School. Oh, you took a picture of me. So do we have any um, <laughs> questions or comments? That one, I, uh, before so, I leave that, I was happy to see the superintendent of the school One of the things that is a... Tension of discussion right now, and I don't think we can pull it off whether some people like it or not. But I feel that the high school staff dismissal time cannot be moved. And according to the article in the paper after the hearing, any change would be about $175,000 more that this city doesn't have, unless you want to run 
and any ultimate change is going to severely financially impact the Aquatic and Family Center, which everybody should realize is self-funded. And there's a lot of that. Those figures should be coming out as we get uh, into the uh, budget discussion. What it costs to keep that facility open, the pool, the tennis courts, the gym, and the excess that's coming into the city that doesn't have to be part of the city budget. Well, uh, we're right in the budget negotiation. I just got off the phone with Anna Maria Maggio. They're very concerned that if you know, any more impact, it's in the winter months, because the high school swim team is part of the school facility using it. If they're in there in the pool any later in the afternoon, we can start seriously financially impacting that whole thing. And that is the discussion that may very well keep the school start and dismissal time right where it is right now, and a lot of students don't want to change. But that's something that between the school department, the rec department, the city council, it's got to be ironed out before it's July 1st. Well, it's great that we have the superintendent. Yeah, so it is. If you want to so, get an update on the start time. Uh, I'm happy to. We're right now conducting a series of public forums so that people can uh, share their opinions with me or their ideas of what they think we could do to move the high school start time later. I'm going to bring the, the proposals to the school committee in September, and the school committee will decide to either make no change to the start time, yeah. or to choose one of the three proposals to change the high school start time. And whatever they decide will go into place the following September 2013. So there'll be absolutely be no change for at least another year. And we'll see how and we'll see what's budgets going to be. and, and the gas start. prices and diesel right. fuel prices to it may it may may may, may force it that you can't make any change. It'll, it's the it's school committee budget. will have to decide. Yeah. I will yeah. share my best proposals with them, and yeah. the decision will be for yeah. them, right for the following year. Yeah. But we have much bigger challenges in the schools, as, as the we do. We uh, uh, you uh, saw uh, that graphic where the schools <laughs> represent such a large part of the budget. Yeah. They are going to feel the brunt of this uh, of this of, of this level funding the most. So mm -hmm. that's going to be between now and uh, when we put the budget together. One of my goals is to try to figure out how we can lessen that. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's going to, some of it's going to hinge on the state aid number, some of it's going to hinge on um, the health care number, and also if we can find other savings in other departments to try to, because again, I, I uh, want to try to, uh, overall philosophy, we want to try to avoid having to lay people off. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the superintendent's in a position where he, under contract, has to begin giving layoff notices now under the contract. My hope is that we can Every year we go through, or we've gone through this, where we have to give people layoff notices and then hope that we have the funding to be able to restore those jobs. So um, that's 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 the thing that is keeping me up at night a lot <laughs> these days. It's worrying about the school department, um, and my kids are in the school, so I, I understand it firsthand. Other questions or ideas or areas that you think the city could do a better job or could save money or could yes. Mayor Higgins had a, a budget plan that included the DPW new building. That seems to have evaporated. It hasn't, eva it hasn't evaporated. Uh, it's in our it's in our debts. It's still programmed into our debt schedule. Uh, there was a there was a initial estimate to try to start construction on it in this fiscal year. Um, I have this, I, because of the fact that we're having to absorb that $600,000 increase in our debt service, I did not believe that we could bring forward the project this fiscal year. Um, so what we've done is we've short-term bonded the, the, uh, the cost that we've done for design so far. Uh, and we are going to, my, my plan in the next, uh, once we get a little bit further along this process, is I want to expand the building committee. There, is a, there was a building committee that was formed within the Board of Public Works of Board of Public Works members and DPW employees. I want to expand that committee and, and spend some time reviewing that plan with the public, getting them to understand it. I mean, definitely that's a, a severe need in the city. For those who don't know it, uh, our DPW uh, work in a trolley barn uh, from the 1800s that uh, has deplorable conditions, uh, 
poor air quality. Uh, you know, you, they have to move every vehicle to get the vehicle out because they're all stacked in there. They don't have uh, the kind of equipment that they need to work on things. So that's been a long-range goal of the DPW is to try to build a new facility at some point. The challenge, of course, is uh, even though we pay for that using you know, long-term bonding, we have to be able to make the debt service payments. Um, a similar thing happened with the police station. Uh, we had it all programmed into our debt schedule. We were prepared to build it, I think, two or three years ago. Uh, we got right up to the point where we were ready to move forward. The economy collapsed, our budget collapsed. We knew that we couldn't, we weren't going to see the growth in our budget to support the debt service, so we basically put the plan on the shelf. And it sat there for two years. And uh, we then brought it back out again. We went to the taxpayers and we asked whether they'd be willing to fund part of the project as a debt exclusion override. Um, and they did. And I think actually it was, a, it was a wise decision because we were able to get really low construction costs. And we just went out to borrow on that bond for 20 years. And we got about 2.5% interest rates over 20 years. So um, even though it was a strange, it was a counterintuitive time to try to build it, it, it ended up, we were probably building that building for less than we ever could build it again. Um, and unfortunately, the way it had been structured on the debt schedule was the police station was supposed to be about four to five years separated from the DPW facility. When the police station got delayed, suddenly I was presented with a plan that showed police station being built in FY12, DPW being built in FY13, and it just it couldn't work. So. I've talked to the director about this, and, and I, I, I plan to keep the conversation going and hopefully try to revisit it in the next fiscal year. I just, we can't, we can't afford to do it in this fiscal year. Is, uh, are there major decreases in debt service payments coming up as those are debt service payments? There are. So things like uh, the, the override, the way the uh, debt exclusions work is they do go down each year. So we have some projects like the fire station, like the high school, like JFK, that are slowly coming down. Um, which free up excess capacity. Um, there are some, like the Senior Center, we're going to be receiving another, I think, three years of debt service from CDBG money, and then it's going to fall, the rest of it will fall to the general fund. So that's been built into this. And then there's other long-term debt where we borrowed, you know, 15, 5, 20 years for various projects. We have it all on a master debt schedule. And again, what we constantly look at is how much is that contribution going to be from the general fund uh, to be able to make those payments. And in a year where we don't have any growth in revenues, where we don't have any growth in aid, it's very difficult to justify, we just can't expand that um, without cutting uh, immediate operating expenses to be able to pay for it. So, so that is, a, and we have a capital improvements program that meets, that comes up with a five-year plan. These are the priorities that we want to do over the next five years, and we try to work from that blueprint to program that again. And as you know, the DPW has its own, also does the same thing in the sewer enterprise fund and the water enterprise fund, where they're putting aside money from those budgets to make needed improvements to sewer systems or to water systems. Um, so that's that's the story on the capital side. Robert's got a question. Okay, and then this gentleman also. Mm -hmm. Yes. My turn. Thank you. In the Department of Public Works. Okay. I saw vertical electric I saw electrical tracks in the DPW trolley building. Yeah. And that makes me think it makes me think it's a garage trolley or a trolley car. It was. And actually unfortunately this winter we had um, one of our new big uh, dump trucks drove in that garage and a piece of concrete about, you know, three by three foot square fell through the floor <laughs> under the weight of it. Um, and we discovered that there used to have these, uh, the trolleys would come in and there were like little channels so that people could work on them from underneath. Um, and when they turned it into a DPW bar, they basically poured this, it's only about four to six inches of concrete floating floor that's sitting basically on these old timbers. Um, and, and in one area, the timber had rotted out completely. Um, and so the building inspector had to come in. We've now shored it up. We brought an engineer in uh, to try to make sure that it's safe. You know, we have, they have uh, jacks where they lift trucks up on, on, uh, on an overhead lift and 
that sitting on the same floor. So it just gives you a sense of how old that building is. Um, the same thing happened with our fire department a few years ago. We had a fire, we, ha we literally had a, a, um, a fire department building that was condemned. It had been condemned for 100 years, and it wasn't structurally sound to keep our biggest engines in them. Uh, and it took us many years to finally be able to build a new station, uh, but we're facing a similar thing Payment in lieu of taxes. Great question. Revenue. Definitely. Do you have a do you have any concerted effort on that? Well, I'm I'm actually uh, so we do um, we we do receive some limited pilots right now. Uh, we receive, for example, pilots from the Northampton Housing Authority. Uh, we also receive a small some small pilots from the state. We have a limited pilot with Smith College uh, that was negotiated several years ago when. There was a major redevelopment uh, in a neighborhood where they tore down several mm -hmm. housing units to build the new Smith Have you done a study of the cost of the services you provide them? Uh, we, we've done, we've, I've actually, this is a good question because I've had an intern that's been working on this very question for me. The city of Boston, uh, Mayor Medino recently implemented a new program in Boston where they uh, took the, rather than trying to negotiate individual pilot agreements with different schools, which is the way it sort of worked on an ad hoc basis, they took a more holistic look. They looked at, again, what percent, like you said, what percentages of city services. They came up with a number of about 25% um, for the police, fire, roads, and you know, plowing, all those kinds of things. The other, the other, 25%. The other side of that is houses of worship. That's another, very, very another sticky one. We've actually had to send tax bills to two of our closed churches for the first time. Uh, but that gets into a very difficult area. So what they did in Boston is they did a voluntary program, essentially, where they calculated what 25% of the tax bill would be, and they sent it out to all the nonprofits, and they asked them to pay voluntarily. Well, and, and, and to be very, very flamboyant, have you ever gone public and indicated the dollars that have gone to the not-for-profits and made it for everybody to see. We've had discussions of it over over a long period of time. The interesting thing about Smith College, for example, is they are they are our largest tax exempt uh, taxpayer, but they're also our largest taxpayer. They act they, they they pay the most in taxes because many of their properties are taxable, uh, and so. They put out lots of numbers every year about how much they pay in taxes, how much they provide in services, how much they provide. Uh, the superintendent can tell you that they do provide a lot That's of cool. in-kind services. Our students can attend, take classes. I, I have been involved in yeah. this, and uh, it's customary for the colleges to put it out. Exactly. And it's exactly. customary for the municipality to go back. And, and so and I do think it. that... Well, my point is, will you go public? I, what I'm doing right now is I'm doing this research, and I will be going public with it at a time. I congratulate you. Thanks a lot of coverage. I understand that. Uh, the other difficulty, though, is that Boston has many more nonprofits than we have. We, you know, they have you know, dozens of hospitals, dozens of universities. Okay. We only really have two or three. Well, I, give you, uh, I was the assistant to the mayor in Newton. Oh, okay. And what I did is I threatened. Former principal in Newton. Here. <laughs> I threatened to invoke police on the, all the cars parked at Boston <laughs> College. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we should talk after. <laughs> uh, as long as you don't uh, pick at my car. Okay. Uh, uh, so yeah, pilot is an area that I'm looking at. I actually did a, a January term project with some students at Smith okay. um, to look at this question. The fallback strategy is a SADA, a service of lower taxes. And one of the things we did is we got Boston College to provide use of their athletic facilities, mm -hmm. as well as run special programs. Mm -hmm. And that that uh, that was a fallback, and it worked fairly well. Okay. Smith does that. Takes a lot of courage. Smith, yeah, Smith does that as well already for some right. of their stuff. And, and, I, and I will say Boston College, interestingly, is one of the colleges that's refused to pay Mayor Menino's um, yes. voluntary program because they don't mm -hmm. want all the other cities that they have, you know, facilities in to do the same thing. So it's a, it's been a long conversation. In, the other thing is that in Boston and in Cambridge, they actually have more zoning authority than we have. Uh, the colleges and universities are exempt from zoning, um, as we saw uh, 
and churches and agricultural are exempt from zoning. So we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have the hammer, as it were. We don't have a lot to hold over their head. Whereas in Boston and Cambridge, Boston got an exemption from that. And, uh, and Holland, Cambridge got a Holland special MIT legislation. The next exactly, so because they are exempt from that. So anytime someone wants to do a major zoning expansion, yeah. pilot is just an assumed discussion point uh, between those colleges uh, and, and either Boston or Cambridge. So that is something I'm looking at, and I'm hoping to unveil some kind of a program that we can have a community conversation Good luck. about. Good luck indeed. <laughs> I have a sister-in-law that works for Smith College, and lots of people in the community are employed by Smith College, and so it's been a source of discussion over many years, and I feel like we should just have it and go through the exercise and, and see what happens. So, thank you. Any other uh, questions or suggestions? Or? I have one. I'm sorry. Okay. Sure. Question? Um, well, you can to me. Oh, how do you remember me? How do you remember me? Uh, well, we've met at these. Maybe you've come to one of these before. Yeah, we've met. I thought you. I thought you. I thought you meant that you met me longer ago than just two months ago. I think it was just two months ago. Yeah, at my very first pizza lunch. Yeah. Oh. Okay. oh okay. I'm I remember everybody you know, that almost everybody knows me. Again. They know my name. Everybody around me knows me. 29,000 people, they all know my name. They all know me. Because they're always seeing me ride my bike around town. Yeah, you're, a, you're a fixture around town. <laughs> Are there any other, uh, any other questions or comments? Of this, or did one of you want to hear? Well, just, just a reminder that all the things we've been talking about are essentially cost shifting. Because costs don't go away, they just get shifted around. Mm -hmm. So we can shift part of it to nonprofits. Say we charge Clark School for police and fire protection. Well, the money that Clark School gets comes from the city. So all we're doing is just shifting the costs around. And you can only do that so much. And part of what's happening in our budget is a shifting in terms of the state, you know, state is now backing off on the things that it used to fund yes. uh, and, and increasingly putting mandates on us but not giving us the funding to pay for it. The federal government has completely withdrawn, um, and so what, you know, everything rolls downhill here to the local level. Well, yes, but we're the ones that keep voting and lobbying the, the Congress and the state legislature to reduce income taxes, too. So Oddly enough. Yeah. If you want to know where the problem starts, look in the mirror. Exactly. No, I definitely, I think looking at our tax structure in Massachusetts, because we're so heavily reliant on property taxes, mm. and it's the most regressive form of taxation. So yes. taking a, you know, we have we have a flat tax in Massachusetts. I think we need to look at a, a more progressive tax system. Um, it's the only way they're going to seriously be able to raise the revenue. Pay. But it requires a constitutional amendment, uh, which is a very long process to amend our constitution. Senator Rosenberg did file an amendment to, 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 to begin that process, but it mm -hmm. takes several sessions to try to do it. It did go on the ballot, you know, a decade or so ago, and it failed. Um, but there's a group called Yes for Northampton, I think, that's working on that. They are working on some, some measures to try to, to push that forward. Um, so we'll see. Um, and again, I think the governor, you know, the state has its issues. We were just, I was at a municipal conference with, um, that Stan Rosenberg puts on every year, and the, um, he had the, the chairman of the Senate, of the House and Senate Revenue Committee, and they were talking about what's called the tax expenditure budget in the state budget, which is essentially, in every budget, this is all the loopholes. These are all the tax loopholes that have been created over time, and that amounts to about $26 billion in our state budget. Um, Again, this is a budget that I think generates about $20 billion in revenue, and we have $26 billion in these taxes. So this is like, you know, uh, tax break for, you know, this particular defense contractor or a tax break for the film industry because we're going to turn Massachusetts right. into Hollywood. And, or, you know, all these things that kind of get put on the, on the rolls, they're never examined. There's no sunset clause. So they formed a commission to finally sort of bring all this stuff out into the open. They've now kind of find the issue 
and now they're going to have a conversation about how do we, you know, should we just cancel all these and start from scratch? Do we? How That's do we how we study? got Coca Cola to come to Northampton, and how we got the exactly. home mortgage. Exactly. So you study these things to figure out what's economic development, what's a giveaway. Uh, what's really been working, what hasn't been. But that's another major area of the state budget that could be reformed. And we'd see a lot. I mean, $26 billion in tax giveaways, um, the total amount that's given to cities and towns each year is $5 billion um, as a state budget. So, you know, you do the math. <laughs> uh, Mr. Superintendent. I'd like to make a comment if I can. First, I want to thank you for your presentation. I think you put together a very clear and understandable presentation that's thorough and comprehensive, and I know it's a lot of work on your part and the people in your office to put this together. Um, but I also admire your commitment to bringing this to the public in your series of meetings. It takes a lot of time and energy, but uh, shows your value of bringing this to people before all the decisions are made. And you made that campaign promise, and you're living up to it. And I, I admire that, and I applaud that effort. I want to comment on one of your slides, and that is the school choice and charter school, which I think is an important slide, and I'm glad you included that. Mm -hmm. That's one way that I think we can turn around our school finances and also our city finances, in that those people that are choosing to go to charter schools or school choice out, um, sometimes, uh, well, every person has their own story as to why they're making that choice, but the general reason that I hear from people and we do exit surveys when they choose to leave our schools to, so we um, get to know why they're going to tell us why they're leaving, you know, and we hope that's the real reason. Uh, a lot of times, uh, for example, the Chinese Immersion School, they have obviously a bilingual program in their elementary schools, and we don't offer that, so mm -hmm. we really can't compete with that. If we could put the second language in our elementary schools, maybe we could persuade some of those people to stay with us or to come back. The same goes for some of the charter schools where, for some, some reason, people think that the class sizes are much smaller in the charter schools than the private schools. And I've personally gone to visit all of those schools, and they're not any smaller than the <laughs> class size that we have here. If I stand in the classroom and count the heads at Bridge Street or Leeds and then stand in uh, Smith Campus School or PVPA, um, they count the heads, our class sizes are comparable. And so I'm trying to get that message out. And what, uh, to bring my point to conclusion, is that if we keep our schools strong, we keep promoting our schools and bringing the programs to our schools that families want, more families will choose to stay with us, and families will also choose to return to our schools. And as you can see, that number is um, $2.5 million, just, in, just above $2.5 million that it's costing us to pay tuition for kids to go to other schools. We invest in our schools, that $2.5 million comes back into our school budget because the kids aren't leaving us. And that's what I want to work on with my team, and that's what I want to work on with the mayor to improve not only the programs in our schools, but the perception of the programs in our schools so we can help that to turn around. Thank you. But also by increasing the competitiveness of North Tampa Public Schools, you're going to be bringing kids back into the system. We're now in private schools where the parents are paying tuition in addition to their taxes. So there's that's got to be netted out somehow. One of the things that I'm going to address back to you. I think you have that. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> we have an interesting situation. We had a bond issue in 1993. And we needed, it was a two and a half override three joints, and it's two. And Lyon didn't renovate what is now JFK Middle School. The bond issue went through. Stipulation was that we would set up the rec department, an aquatic and family center. And now raises, and this is something, the rec department and you and the school, school board should investigate. We're giving quite a bit back to the city. And the kids are getting a beautifully maintained swimming pool and the gym and the tennis course. They don't realize that their parents don't realize it's the use of fees in all the programs the rec department runs. That's where the money's coming from. It is coming out of the city's taxpayers or the budget. And that's the concern I have as somebody who uses that pool for cardiovascular fitness. 
we can't really, the, the crunch time comes in the winter time. And it was set up so that from 2.30 to 4.30, the high school swim team has it for practice for three and a half months. And just like during the, during the day, that's is it for something for the, for the kids. If you jump the start and dismissal time anymore, and we start eroding memberships, the money that costs to keep that facility complex is going to disappear. First of all, first thing we know, we know uh, that's going to be a big chunk I know the city's rec department. That's, this, this is the, this one of the sticking points right now. I, I do with appreciate this, uh, the this, uh, and, uh, everybody. And I do friend. respect your opinion on that. And uh, you did share it at school committee a couple months ago. I think it was great that you used the public yeah, comment. Yeah, you, 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 you've, got a two, you've got a two-way partnership mm -hmm. for the school, school department and the rec department in, in this facility. And look what we're getting out of it. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing up yeah, that. Yeah, I point. think, uh, plus the fact, and I think it was in the paper, even your proposal means $175,000 more when we proposal. go to get it. When yeah. we go to get it. That, it's the, one of the things that's going to keep that start is, is uh, transportation costs with escalating diesel fuel prices. Thank you and that's that. something right in the city budget. Mm -hmm. right, a, a good chunk of it. Thank you. Now, with, uh, I'm glad we're having all these meetings as we the city hammers up the budget for next year. Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Oh, talking about, we're talking about kids going to charter schools, and, and you're losing money to kids who are going to school choice or charter schools. How, I don't understand how you're losing money by kids going, I mean, kids going to other schools. I don't so understand a, that money situation. When a child goes to, uh, if a child choices into, say, East Hampton, schools, we have to pay $5,000 tuition for that student to the East Hampton Public Schools. The same happens if one of their students comes here. If they go to a charter school, it's even larger. The tuition amount it can be as much as twelve dollars to $15,000 per student, which is another disparity in the way we fund these two programs. So if a child chooses to come to Northampton, they get $5,000. If they go to uh, PDPA, they get twelve, thirteen, fourteen. dollars so there's a lot of different areas where it's uh, where there's again this was a, these are essentially state-run schools, state chartered schools. Um, some of us have argued maybe there should just be a separate line item in the state budget to give them their funding under Chapter 70, rather than taking it out of our budget because then it's difficult for us to be able to budget not knowing who's coming, who's going every year. Well, the way they would get it in the bad budget would be by taking it from our budget. That you're right. <laughs> but, 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 the, but, but the point, though, is that right now, it only comes out of schools that have charter schools mm -hmm. near them. Mm -hmm. If you live in a community that doesn't have any charter schools around you, so at least the cost would be spread out over yes. all 351 cities and towns. So if it's a state commitment to charter schools, it would be shared by all of us. Right now, in Northampton, we have four to five charter schools near us, so we get, you know, we just have that many more opportunities. Um, again, I'm not trying to say anything bad about charter schools. Obviously, families have that choice. It's an option under the law, et cetera, but it's not without its impacts on the, the primary public schools. So, yeah. Uh, do the charter schools have all the extras that the, that the public school system seems to have, like bands and, and extracurricular activities? So, I mean, we have a granddaughter in the JFK who went to the and then came back here, and it's, I mean, you've offered so much more. I agree. It's a much richer yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. environment. She's blissfully happy. Yeah. And Both my girls are at JFK. And, and, they and have it's had a superb school. school. Yeah. And it, I think, I wonder if people understand. The superintendent, yeah. you've been to the charter school, so I Yes, I've visited all of the charters. Do they have all those kinds of things? They do not have as many. <laughs> they do have some extracurriculars, but they don't have as many as we provide. You have a music woman that is on this floor. 
we have incredible music and art teachers. Yeah. Between Deb Kuhn and Paul Flight, mm -hmm. you've got a dynamic yeah. duo yeah. that. I've just got some wonderful things going on there. I think somehow or other we've we got people need to use And I would add to that spread. that we have such rich programs that we also have a system of volunteers and people from the community. Uh, we have 200 volunteers in our schools who are talented people who live right here to help our kids. At least one here. We'll take two more. <laughs> Sir, there any? Sir, thank you for the pizza. Oh, you're <laughs> welcome. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, you know, we do this every month at the Senior Center. It's not just yeah. budget slideshows. But yeah, I have to say, as you heard the school, we're having a lovely time on Thursday evenings. Oh, watching. Oh, so oh, watching. We so love it. Okay. <laughs> how, many, how many chickens? Uh, yeah, the city council, we took the first reading, but we're going to expand from three to six, the number of chickens that people can keep in their, in their backyards. It's a delicious conversation. In residentially it's yeah, it was, uh, It's very good. Yes. So, so, uh, well, thank you all for coming, and uh, oh, grab a slice of pizza on your way out. And if you have any questions, call my office or email my office. And I'm always happy to Brian, I'm glad you came. Thank you. All right.